purpose. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you again on the Sabbath and invite your Holy Spirit's presence. Be with us in our discussion and the questions and answers. We pray that uh, you can give us the answers and that you can bring about a unity up to this movement as we unite with you, that we can be united with one another. We ask for forgiveness for the thoughts and feelings that we have at times. We know, Lord, that Satan is always seeking to destroy. But we come to you, Lord, for healing and that we can participate with you in the work of binding up the wounds and healing the brokenhearted. May your angels be with us now. May you speak to us clearly. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to have some questions and answers. And um, we have a lot of different topics we've studied this week that I want to go through. I know that uh, uh, Stephen did a study, and it's getting pretty late. What time is it now for you, Stephen? Over About here. To 10. Yeah. So yeah, 10, 10 40 yet. Are you getting tired? Uh, I already had a nap there just during your last presentation. <laughs> during, during my last presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and Tom and Phyllis, you guys go to late bed late anyway, don't you? We do now. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, uh, you had a question, Tom, was it you that you wanted? Yeah, it's, it's just something, and I don't know, just, I was just thinking, and I just thought I'd throw it out there because I believe there's no bad question. But uh, a thing that sticks out on that line is the 10 days. It sort of hangs there on its own. And I was thinking uh, if we were mirroring the uh, Millerite movement and what have you. I was thinking on the 2300 days and I finished in 1844. Mm -hmm. But then we had an extension to 1863 of the 19 years, mm -hmm. which went beyond what the people could see. And it sort of balanced out the, the chaos. Them. And I'm looking at, at the pattern on the, on, on the board here and I'm thinking that, do you think we have another 10 days between December 25th and what that takes to us, and it gives us a three six three. Yeah, well, well, we had ten days also from um, when uh, Tess presented November 9th, and then I uh, did the calculation on October thirteenth. Uh, so ten days is it's a period of test, right? Yeah. So that's the bit I I might be missing on on the on the. What's yeah, on the board. So, so it's yeah so it's a period of test now um and, and for this movement from january 6th to january 16th there was uh things that we were sorting out and i believe that that was part of that we were finding a lot of light addressing the lines and the chronology so that 10 days has a lot in it um well the other thing though too about december 25th um is that it is connected because it's the 20th day of the ninth month. And when we look at Ezra chapter 10, we, we have been paralleling uh, that three day call to Jerusalem to repent of the marriage to the strange wives. Uh, we've been paralleling that to uh, the period from July 18th, to December 25th. So we believe that we are being called by God to this date and, and to recognize this date. That's basically what I was asking the Canadian group. If people were willing to step, step up and say that they accept this date as part of our lines. Because some have given lip service to July 18th. But if you don't accept just December 25th, you've rejected July 18th. Uh, can we see that that's the case? Well, I think it's pretty plain. Yeah. Yeah, that's clear. Yeah. 
So I was giving people an opportunity, not that I'm the judge of anyone, but I just felt people needed an opportunity to examine whether they ex actually accept these lines or not. And I know that there are people that don't. Prominent people in our movement do not accept these lines, even though they will give lip service to July 18th. They're not going to accept this whole structure. And of course, that, that, that would be foolish because the structure is all part of a unit. It, it, July 18th doesn't exist by itself. <laughs> so, so none of them, so, none of them can stand by themselves. No, no. you know, it, it's like saying, you, you know, you, you accept, uh, uh, that Jesus Christ died, Jesus Christ died in, in the middle of the 70th week, but you don't accept the 2300 days. Mm -hmm. I mean, you say, well, I can accept that part, the 70 weeks, but I don't agree with the 2300 days. Well, if you don't agree with the 2300 days, you're not going to long hold on to the 70 weeks. No. So, so I think this movement has to address this point. And, you know, we may not address it today. Maybe it's going to be addressed in the future. But I don't think that we can just let it slide, that we can just say, well, you know, we're glad that 70, 777 days is over, so we don't have to worry about it again. But I think for some people, that is really the feeling they have about it. It's like, uh, like for many Seventh-day Adventists, when it comes to October 22nd, 1844, it's just an embarrassment. Even if, even if they accept the date, they, they really don't like the fact that we have it. So, so that's what I would have to say about this. This 10 days is, is the 10 days of prayer of the, United, of the, of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's a 10th of the 100 days of prayer. And that 100 days of prayer, of course, is connected by 187 days. And, and we can see those two periods of 13 days with the 18,720 minutes. So we know the bombing of Nashville on December 25th is connected to our prediction on July 18th. And, and that's something that people would have to say they agree with. If somebody was to say, I agree with July 18th, but what happened on December 25th was insignificant they would be rejecting July 18th, correct? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Theodore, did I hear you correct when you said something about the bombing of Nashville being in September? December. December 25th, 2020, there was a bomb that was exploded in Nashville. Do you remember that, last Christmas? No, I actually don't. Okay. Oh, so last okay. Christmas there was a bomb. It was it was by what an AT and T building. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And and this guy put a bunch of explosives in his truck, quite a big bomb, or his his motorhome, and exploded. It committed suicide. And that was 13 days before the siege of Washington. But you can see it's part of this structure, right? So this structure that we see here, July 4th which is the end of the 100 days of prayer. It's 187 days to the beginning of the 10 days of prayer. And that these two periods of 13 days that are 18,720 minutes are symbols of July 18th. And so we would have to argue that what happened on December 25th, 2020 with the bombing of Nashville is related to our prediction of July 18th. Now we could say maybe it's an echo or it's some kind of uh, mirror of what was supposed to happen on July 18th. But we have to we have to admit it's part of a structure. And then we would have to say that January 6th, with the siege of Washington, is part of our structure. That we we can't just brush it aside and ignore it. Um, but there would be some people who don't accept this. That they would be sympathetic with the declaration made on December 6th by those who remained at FFA, where they rejected the symbolic use of numbers. So we know there's people in this movement who really don't like any of this chronology. Yeah, so Anthony Q. Warner uh, was the guy, and his name adds up to 193. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there was one person killed at the siege. That was Ashley Elizabeth Babbitt. And I showed this the other day, that her name um, in Hebrew, and, and I think actually I showed it in the... With gematria? Yeah, so the type of gematria of it. Um, so I'm going to bring up this paper here. 
and it's going to be here. Stay on a second. That's no good. Okay. Yeah, so it's the paper's entitled The Martyrdom of Ashley Elizabeth Babbitt in the Siege of Washington, D.C. on January 6th, 2021. And I go through and explain some of the things about the 25 uh, or the 777 structure, Raffi and Paneum, as we were understanding it. This is actually a chart made by Odilio. So you can see the uh, we had Raffi and Paneum marked here. Then the storming of the Capitol, the Christmas Day bombing of Nashville. Oh, I'm not, not sure. showing it. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, I'll go back. So here you can see this is the, the paper. That's Ashley Elizabeth Babbitt. And so I go through and talk about the structure as we understood it initially with the 777 days. And we can see that if we take the gematria of Raffi and Paneum, that is, if we add um, them together, or we actually subtract them, we subtract Raffi from Paneum, we get 21, and 21 is 777, 7, 7 plus 7 plus 7. So we had all these different symbols. And, and I actually agree that we can look at Raffi and Paneum as being November 9th and December 25th, 2021 that is there is a way to understand that that is is correct but this is about something internal can we agree with that uh, yeah Everyone has to call me so comment. okay somebody had a comment Dana. okay what's the comment no, I just said Iran put in a comment a comment on the chat. Oh, oh okay. Ashley's name. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. So I'd forgotten about the bombing. Yeah, it was 187 days from Jeff's advertisement in the Tennessean. So that's another interesting thing about it, but we'll come back to that. Um so we know about the storming of the Capitol building and the Chris Christmas Day bombing of Nashville. So, uh, and the symbol of that, it was the 10th day of the 10th month. Uh, and the 10th day of the 10th month is a symbol of the siege. Now the siege is gonna follow on the 22nd day of the 10th month. So, <clears throat> uh, on the biblical calendar. Um, so it's actually one year to the day from the end of our 777 prophetic structure. Um, but the interesting thing for me, if I go back here, is Ashley's name. Now, what is Ashley, what does the name Ash refer to? Is there any relationship between Nashville and Ashley? Anybody know? Aren't they both giving references to the type of tree? Okay, so a Nash is actually ash. It's an ash tree. And Ashley means an ash tree meadow. Now, um, and, and that's just ash, the, the tree, and Leah means meadow, forest, clearing. Now, Elizabeth means God of the seven times. So, So that's significant, isn't it? I think it adds to it, yes. <laughs> and um, which means um, the God of the oath being that to make an oath means to swear seven times. And the name Babbitt, of course, is um, not a Hebrew name, uh, but it's part of the ancient leg legacy of the Anglo-Saxon tribes in Britain of Britain. It's a, a product of when a family lived in Suffolk. The surname Babbitt 
refers to a person who came from Babe, which may refer to an area known as the Hundred of Babe in the country of Suffolk. Now, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but Suffolk? Suffolk? Yeah, Suffolk. The place name literally means Baba's Enclosure. Baba is a personal name meaning protector. So the significance of that, it's, it's hard to say. Regarding the name Nashville, as we see in connection with Ashley, Nashville means near an ash tree or near a place called ash. Now, the interesting thing is the gematria. So the gematria here is, is simply taking the Hebrew name and using the numbers because Hebrew uh, uses each of the letters of the alphabet is a number in Hebrew. So when we do English gematria, we just count the letters of the alphabet up to 1 to 26. But in Hebrew, uh, the first nine um, letters represents the di- represent the digits 1 to 9. And then Yod represents 10 and, and, and onward, right? So each of the letters are, are going to just be 20s and then to 100s. So that's how it works. Now, if we take Ashley, it's going to add up to 341 and the word elizabeth is 413 and the word babbit is 23 together those all add up to 777 so to me this is quite significant she becomes a symbol now what does it mean that she's a symbol when she's killed in this siege I don't really trust a uh, touch on that in the paper. A symbol of Raphia. Okay, well, <clears throat> well, it's the symbol of the seven 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 is there, but what would it mean that she dies? Now, no, also her name Ashley Babbitt. If you just take her name in English, adds up to one hundred and five, which is a symbol of the tenth day of the fifth month. But is, what is she representing? Possibly the end of democracy as we know it. Okay. Well, she's a woman, but is she a normal woman? Like, is she a woman that we would say represents a church, or is she a woman that represents something else? Because of her service, didn't she represent, um, represent a civil power? Okay. Um, I don't. I don't know if I would have her representing a civil power. I mean, she's part of a rebellion. Instead of civil, would this represent a military power? In okay. In, go ahead. So she would represent republicanism. Would, would that make sense? Or something connected with the Constitution? Justice. Because she's, she's, you know, her name adds up to 777. Her middle name is God of the Oath. Is it something to do with the covenant that God had made with the United States, so to speak? Seems that way. Can we see that she represents the end of the United States? Is that making sense? The end of republicanism. Yeah, the end of republicanism, the end of the United States, in, in, in that sense of being a Republican two-horned power. Now, also her name can be translated as my tamarisk tree, that is, The Hebrew word Ashley is, you know, if you just take it as the Hebrew word Ashley, it means my tamarisk tree. A tamarisk is mentioned in Genesis 23, 33. Abraham is recorded to have planted a tamarisk at Beersheba. What is Beersheba? The well of the oath. The well of the oath or the well of the seven times. And the word Babbitt could be translated as apple of my eye. Now, the Hebrew word apple of my eye is not referring to the fruit. 
um, it's referring to the pupil that's called the apple of the eye. And, and it's, of course, very sensitive, right? So when somebody's the apple of your eye, um, if they're touched, you're going to feel it. So can we see that this does represent the United States in that covenant that they that God, God made with them when he raised them up as a nation? Is that, am I stretching things? Theodore, I kind of, I, I've been different than most people in the, in the movement in that I saw the, um, I saw it as an invasion. Um, yeah. So, and, and I, I struggle with that because I, I, I don't, I don't know how, uh, am I too politically involved in this? Like all the numbers you're, ma- you're saying, they all make sense. So, and it, it just all makes sense. But I just saw the horror of that. And, and I struggle that. that yeah, but this, the, yeah, this, yeah, I understand what you're saying. This is not about whether we support it or not. That's not really the issue. The issue is what does it symbolize? And Okay, that's, yeah. that's easier to, yeah. yeah. But I would say that the media, what you hear in the media uh, is, is completely in error. That is, this, this was actually enacted not by the, the patriots. Many of those people who went in, they were actually on the left. They weren't on the right. They were trying to create trouble um, there intentionally. And, and people just walked in. There wasn't, uh, the, the protesters were not in a riot at all. There were a few, and many of those people were there with the intention to cause a riot and were not Trump supporters. But the media is not going to tell you this. And, and this, again, is where I really struggle because I don't believe the media on the right or on the left. It's not a matter of the re- media on the right. I don't believe the media on the right either. No. So the, they just walked in, but where was all the security? Isn't that place heavily secured? Well, it wasn't secured. And there's obviously a political battle going on about this. But I, I wouldn't listen to the media on the right or the left. All you would want to do is look at the facts as they Since exist. They had their own agenda. So there are facts that we can find that have nothing to do with the media because the political pundits, they all spin things however they want to spin them. But we look at this not politically, but prophetically. That is, we say, okay. what was symbolized there? So the prophetic, I can understand. But when you say there are facts, where are you, act- where are you getting these facts from? I, I don't, I don't understand that. Like, well, how you, do you? You can, you can get them from the news. Just don't listen to what the spin they put on it. So there's, there's all kinds of documents uh, about what happened that day. You can watch the videos yourself. So you don't need to have somebody tell you what happened if you can watch it on video. Right. So those would be facts. I mean, pretty much. We was, can watch uh, I don't know if wish. But how how do you come to the conclusion that there were people in there that were not Trump supporters? They tell us. Yeah, they actually say they're not Trump supporters. They they were um like um they were just activists. Mm-hmm. And they were just going through the. Were they not going through the? Building. People were trying to stop them from from doing damage. Mm-hmm. So, Stephen, you had a comment. Um, yeah, you said that they just walked in. Yeah, but there was uh, at the doorway. I think there was people trying to. There was like a lot of a lot of pushing going on with the doors. Yeah, the doors were shut and they sort of pushed their way in. Yeah, initially the group that pushed in. But I'm saying the other people just walked in. Mm-hmm. So you had many people there just walking in, thinking that they could just walk in. There was no opposition for everyone. There were people who broke in, mm-hmm. I would agree. But that's not representing uh, the vast majority of the people who were there, who even entered the building, had no intention of 
doing damage to the building or stopping the the proceedings that were going on at the Capitol building. So however you want to look at it, it is highly political. And so you have to look at everything with a jaundice eye. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what I look at is I look at the symbols. What the symbols tell me tells me much more than um, what we can get from the news. And we can see that Biden definitely is a globalist. Yes. And Trump wasn't a globalist. So Trump couldn't have been uh, the one who was going to continue. Now, and that's where I would have problems with the idea of Trump coming again. It is possible. But Trump would have to change because Trump is a constitutionalist. The other thing that, that's, that's interesting, because this is obviously a very sensitive issue, but when, when we look at the politics of the United States, Whenever the Democrats are in power, the Republicans are really um, much more about freedom than when they're in power, and vice versa. Yes. People change their political positions. For instance, prior to the pandemic, the average Democrat, the average liberal, did they support the pharmaceutical industry. I, I don't know if anybody knows about that, but most of yeah, them did not. I don't know. They did not support the pharmaceutical industry. It was part of that big bad business, right? And and even initially, when Trump was getting the pharmaceutical companies to bring about these vaccines, the Democrats. Many of them were unwilling to be vaccinated. But then it changes, right? People's political views change depending, and that's because of a party spirit. So, so we know that people are not fixed in, in some kind of principled belief. They're fixed in following a party, a crowd, a group of people. They're political. They're not principled. So, so we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how things are going to unfold. But what we do know is that if, if our understanding of prophecy in, is correct, and I believe it is, that what happened with Trump being overthrown in the way that it was done, that that is a type of raffia, and that we should see the opposite happen and the Republicans coming back into power is some kind of backlash. But I can't tell you that for certain. I think that um, the, the, the line that, that Colin has written out, his, the, his study, I think is, is sound. <clears throat> I think it's sound prophetically, but it doesn't mean that we understand it fully because we're still trying to understand our message. So. And that's what I would say about that. But, but you can see that, you know, the question, uh, what was the original question? <laughs> Brother Theodore? Yeah. Y'all ha um, have a good week and God bless. And I'll try to get back in sometime or another, but I got okay. you here. Okay. Take care, William. So, so what was the original question that I was answering? Uh, yeah, it was, I was just, I noticed the 10 days. I'd, I'd forgot about the. I hadn't forgot about the hundred days previous, ah. but I, I couldn't see the whole diagram. So I was yeah. speculating on the fact that possibly there was going to be another uh, ten days after the twenty fifth of December today that balanced out the chaos. And that's that, that's what the question okay. was. Yeah, and and to answer that question, uh, we we sort of answered it a little bit earlier in the week. Uh, because when we look at December 25th, it's the 20th day of the ninth month. So that's going to be Ezra chapter 10. So let's go there. So in Ezra chapter 10, um, they're going to have the divorce from the strange wives. And that's going to be enacted over a period of 90 days. 
it's actually 89 days, but um, so it's, they're going to be called to uh, Jerusalem and they have to come there within three days and it's in the ninth month and the 20th day of the month, right? So that's the 20th day of the ninth month is December 25th. And then they're going to have uh, this divorce and it's going to happen according to the law. That is, they've had the civil power to do these things and they're going to do it in a way that's orderly and that provides for the women and children who the men are divorcing. So they're going to begin on the first day of the 10th month to examine the matter, says in verse 16. And they made an end with all the men that had taken the strange wives by the first day of the first month. So remember the story of Ezra 7 to 10 from it coming from Babylon and going to Jerusalem begins on the first day of the first month. And it's going to end on the first day of the first month. And what did that tell us when we looked at that? What was the significance of it being one complete year? Okay, let's look at it this way. They're leaving Babylon. And what is completed in that first year? Is it the laying of the cornerstone? Okay. Well, just in, in connection with they left Babylon. So the cornerstone, that's way back in Cyrus's decree because they already built the temple. Okay. Yeah. Right. So – but they're leaving Babylon, so they have to get out of Babylon, right? And they have to go to Jerusalem. But they have with them strange wives. So when they're separated from their strange wives, that's completed one year to the day from when they leave Babylon. So what does this year represent? What is this year, that year? 457 BC. Okay, uh, Dwight and Stephen talking at the same time. It sounded interesting. Go ahead, Dwight. Reunion with God. Okay, reunion with God. So it's a complete coming out of Babylon. Stephen? Yes, I was going to relate it to 1844. Okay. And you had the, the call there come out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that starts on the first, and, and we have the first day of the first month mentioned there as well. Which becomes a way more. But it doesn't end on the first day of the first month. It just ends on the 10th day of the 10th month, or 10th day of the seventh month, I mean, in 1844. But can we look at the first day of the first month as representing, again, our history? That it's a circle, it's a repeat of history. Is that, does that make sense? Now, I also think it's interesting that we have um, 457 BC leading us to 321 AD. So 777 years later. So what is it about the Sunday law that we need to understand that happened in four, uh, 321 AD? What is it about Constantine, Constantine's Sunday law? It was for show only. For show, okay. Um, well, and to gain power. Okay. Um, let's see. For some reason, I 
I've got this right. Okay, so it was for show to gain power. We know it's in 321. Why does this keep doing this? I keep trying to share this, but it won't share it. So maybe I got to share this one. It keeps going back to there. Does make sense? There it goes. Okay. So what do we see here in this line that Stephen's given us? I guess I have to do this. Okay, what do we see in this line? Constantine's Sunday Law. When does it occur? It's in 321. What else do we know about it? March 7. Okay, it's March 7. Okay. What's the significance of that? Anybody remember? Okay, so let's look here. Here we have Haman's decree. Remember the story of Esther? And we can look at this Sunday law. It's March 7, 321. Now we passed a March 7th, 2021, both a Julian and a Gregorian date. And it's 1,700 years between these two Sunday laws, which is pretty easy to count, 321 and 2021. And the dates, 3721 is 3 times 7 times 21 is 444. Or 441, pardon me, which is 144 in... And, and that's, of course, 63 times 7. And then I also have 12 times 7 times 3 equals 252. What's the 12 times 3 times 7? What did I do there? If you can see that. I just inverted the numbers, right? I reversed. I did a mirror image. And if you multiply them together, they equal 252. Now, did we have a Sunday law on March 7th, 2021? I don't think so. No, we didn't. But what would be the significance of March twenty, March 7th, 2021? Why, why would we look at this as significant? Because I wasn't expecting a Sunday law. Okay, it's structure. And, and does this fit into the structure of the lines that we already had? Iran, because he's the one who said it was structure. Yes. So Iran and I had worked on some of this stuff. Now, we can see there's something quite interesting. Now, I don't need you to have to look at the math. But if I take the period of time and look at how many days it is, I could analyze those periods of time. And I could do it in years. The difference of... Uh, 7, 000, 1,700 divided by 10 equals 170 plus 1,700 equals 1,870. And 2021, from 1,870 to 2021 is 151 years. So that's the, the shekels, right? So I don't want you to get bogged down by this. But uh, we could also look at the period of time. Uh, here that it's um, symbolic of we did this calculation. I'm, again, I don't want to go through it. I'm actually using pi. So, so it's kind of interesting. But it, it, that is these numbers, these dates, 
The relationship between these portions from Haman's decree to Constantine Sunday Law and from Constantine Sunday Law to March 7th is pi. That is, it's a ratio of 3.14159265.3. Basically, but the difference is 200 days minus 13 days is 187 days. So I know it's a rather complicated calculation. But Constantine's Sunday Law, we also saw, is 777 years from 457 BC. And we didn't find that out till today that I know of. Um, and so I think it's providential that we found this out today. And any other kinds of questions? I mean, I have questions for Stephen about 508. Sorry, I just zoned out uh, right around the providential. Could you repeat that, please? Um, so uh, I don't remember what I said about providential. Uh, all I know is that these you lines... Just yeah. Sorry, but it just came up today. Okay, so providential in what? Oh, that oh that Stephen found seven hundred and seventy seven. Yeah, so seven hundred and seventy seven years from four fifty seven BC to three twenty one AD. That was found out today. We didn't know that. And and it's something we should have easily seen, but but we didn't see it until today, at the end of 777 days, we come to recognize the 777 years of that diagram that we had was of Stephen's diagram, right? So, Thank you. Yeah, so this period here, and we should have noticed this. I mean, to me, this is like really, really obvious once you see it, but I don't know that I ever did this calculation. And even though we looked at Constantine's Sunday Law, it would have been nice if we had seen this earlier. But God chose us to see it today at the end of 777 days. So what is he telling us by showing us something like this today? That he's still leading us? Yeah, that he's still leading us, right? And that's why I presented it to the Canadian group. Nobody seemed to want to comment on it too much. Right. So we said, well, you know, I want to talk about what Colin was talking about. But here God gave us some light. And shouldn't we rejoice in that light? It would just confirm that it's pertinent to us today. Yeah. That he's leading us. Right. right. That that what we understood about July 18th and about Lamech and about, you know, because when we take Lamech's name and we multiply the letters, you know, we take the gematria for the English Lamech and we multiply them. We get the number 18720, July 18, 2020, right? We get that symbol. And, and so the fact that, you know, God has done all of this and that he gives us something like this on today, I think that we have to look at it as God's guiding hand. And that things that we could have seen, God didn't let us see until we needed to see them. And this is the thing that we have to learn is that God is leading us. This is not a bunch of men studying and coming up with things. It's not created by man. This is us watching the dirt brush man uncover these precious jewels and placing them in a casket. And it's going to shine 10 times brighter than the, the former casket. And I believe that's true. I believe what this movement has uncovered is extremely profound and extremely powerful. A powerful message for Seventh-day Adventists to let them know that God was leading the Millerites, that God led in the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist church, and that God is still leading us. No matter what happens to the church. And that's the message we have to give. Now, some people don't like it that it has chronology attached to it, but that's not my doing. That's God's doing. Correct? Amen. Amen. Yeah, God gave us the time. 
He gave us these symbols. No man dreamed them up. And when, when the, the former FFA, when they wrote that declaration and said, we can't use numbers symbolically, they basically just destroyed the entire message. And they don't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. There's no more FFA, no more movement that they're in charge of. They shot themselves in the foot. And merely because of pride, because they didn't like the people who God had given light to, for whatever reason. They were jealous or whatever reason. Mm-hmm. I don't quite understand it. But that that's why. It wasn't because they had sincere belief that it was wrong. It's because they didn't like the people. And we have to be careful about that, which I've talked about before. Just because somebody rubs us the wrong way doesn't mean that God doesn't have light from them. Because often when somebody irritates us, it actually shows more about something inside of us than in something inside of them. When I'm irritated by somebody, I try to take a long look at myself and say, what is it about them or what is it about me that causes them to make me feel irritated? Not what is it about them that causes me, but what is it about me that makes them irritating to me? Well, and that's all you can control. Well, right. It's the only thing I can control. I can't control other people. But often God is trying to teach us something about ourselves when somebody rubs us the wrong way. Sometimes we're just like that person that we don't like. So we have to be careful. Any other questions? Um, Now, what about December 25th, 508? Stephen, uh, when are you going to do a study on that? When are you going to finish the study on proving whether uh, Clovis is baptized on December 25th, 508 or not? Okay, so I have quite a lot to (laughs) still continue to to study. Okay. but as soon as I can. Okay. So so it might be a week or two. Well, I think it would uh, be more than that. Okay. <laughs> well, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. So it's not slow there in the winter? There's no snow here at the moment, no. Okay. But but it's not slow. Your work isn't slowed down by... Oh, you get slow? a lot of rain, don't no. you? It's cold, though. Not freezing, but it's cold. No. Coolish, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so do that whenever you can. I'm going to try to do some work on that as well. Any other questions that people have about things? Well, I just have a comment about chronology. I mean, chronology is clearly in the Bible. How can you like throw chronology out when it's clearly in the bible we just have to use chronology according to the bible and that's all we're doing right yeah well i mean we think about it god gives us 13 dates in the book of ezekiel and four of those dates are dates in millerite history um it seems to me pretty hard to say, well, why did God give us these specific dates if we're not supposed to understand them? Uh, it, it's like when somebody says, um, well, I just want to know Jesus. Prophecy isn't that important. Well, how much of the Bible is prophecy? Just the love message. Well, yeah. Right. The pretty, whole Bible. Pretty well all of it. Pretty well all of it is prophecy, Right. But even if you try to take away just the symbolic, th- you know, like the stories and stuff, you can still see the vast majority of the Bible is prophetic. Mm-hmm. And, and so it seems kind of odd that a Seventh-day Adventist can say, well, I just want to know about the person of Christ. I'm not really interested in this prophecy. Well, God put it in the Bible. Why aren't you interested in it? Mm-hmm. And, and so God, God gave Adventism chronology. I mean, when I first became an Adventist, I knew – that it was founded upon the date 457 BC. And that if that date wasn't correct, then Adventism had a faulty foundation. 
but some people just say, well, you know, I don't care about 457 BC. It doesn't matter to me. I'm just going to be an Adventist anyway, but you're not going to be much of one. Right. Some people say they just want the simple gospel. But Jesus also said we're supposed to search for truth as for hidden treasure. And we're supposed to be continually growing in knowledge. Yeah. Now, there is this sort of quote, and I would call it an apocryphal quote, something to the effect that uh, it's supposed to be as understood by a child. That is, if, it, if a child can't understand it, then it's not truth. And that's a distortion. Obviously, we need to, the, the truths of Scripture, the plain truths of Scripture, need to be presented in such a way that a child can understand them. Right. That is, we're not supposed to be highfalutin and philosophical. We should be able to present the truths of Scripture in a simple manner. But it doesn't mean that everything in the Bible, if it's beyond the understanding of a five-year-old, is irrelevant. But that's how some people act. Mm -hmm. and, and okay, I think so you're saying that if it's not... Just because it's not simple doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah. And there, there are some things that, and, and, and things, you know, I mean, one of the oppositions we got to the 2520 is it's too complicated. Now, why was the 2520 complicated? Does anybody know why it was complicated? Because of all the details. Uh, and the opposition. People made it complicated. They made it complicated. Exactly. Now, uh, the funny thing about it is people say, well, I believe in the 2300 days. But you can find a lot of books on the 2300 days that are scholarly and complicated. How do you prove 457 BC? If you read what our scholars write about it, you pretty much have to be a scholar to understand it. Definitely a child can't understand uh, the Assyrian records and, and all these different things and, uh, you know, the solar eclipses and how to calculate them and so forth, right? They're not going to understand that. So we say, well, the 2300 days is just too complicated because I can't explain it to my five-year-old. Obviously not. There's a simple explanation. And same with the 2520. I find it actually is more simple to explain and more readily convincing than the 2300 days. I've explained it to lots of people, guitar students, um, you know, friends, Adventists, and, and people find it easy to understand. It's not complicated, but we make things complicated. Now, there, it is involved when it comes to chronology. There's a lot of things, a lot of information, but it's not, it's not rocket science. If we take our time, we can see it. We may not be able to remember all the dates because not everybody has a good memory for numbers. But we at least should be able to, to go to the book of Ezra, for instance. And this, this is a challenge I give each one of you who study this message, is go to Ezra 7 to 10 and write out the dates that are given us on a line with the periods of three days. It's a simple presentation to do. It doesn't take understanding calendars. You can do it all with 30-day months. It's still going to show you a lot of things. And, and, and it's just it's simple. It's not difficult. A child can't understand it. A child could do it. You could take a 10-year-old, have them read Ezra 7 to 10, and ask them to write the dates out on a line. And they may not know that, you know, the first day of the first month is in January 1st. But they can still write out those dates and see the chiasms. <clears throat> yeah. So any other thoughts?
Now, I know you've been praying for one another. You've been praying for this movement, all of you, because you care about the people in this movement. But I think we need to also pray about what we can do for those that aren't here in these studies. It's not the easiest thing when you're at odds with someone, when you know somebody has something against you, but they're never, they're never willing to tell you. They'll just tell other people. And what do we do in a situation like that? Do we just wipe the dust off our feet? What can we do is a question I'm asking. Well, first thing is to get on our knees and pray about it. So pray okay. for those. That's Yeah. So we need to pray and we need to pray for ourselves that just like we read about in, um, was it Ephesians chapter four? Um, you know, about bearing one another's burdens that you are, which are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Consider yourself lest you're also are tempted. Cause definitely we can't have a self-righteous prayer. We need to, to learn to love others. Any other suggestions? Just keep speaking the truth. Okay. Yeah, and I shy away from that. I mean, um, Colin gave me a bit of a talking to uh, this past week. Um, he said I need to speak up more at his studies. And, and I said, I don't really like to, because I know there's people who don't want to hear me. Uh, but he says, you have to speak up. Now, I'd like it if, if Colin spoke up more for me. It'd be nice. But, but that's why, you know, at the study, uh, when I had a chance to get on, you know, I wanted to share. And I was being a bit more bold than I have. But I could see that there is a resistance there. And, and that's not easy to deal with all the time. Because you don't want to be pushy. But, you know, I have a tendency to be uh, pretty passive when it comes to conflicts. So sometimes we do have to learn how to speak up, but we need to know how to do it in love and definitely not take it personally. Always speaking in truth is important. Um, that person may not be at that point yet, or those people, um, or or they may actually be speaking out against truth that they know is truth. So praying, yes, the most important thing. Um, then studying to make sure that it's truth, but you know, the leaders at the top, the people putting out information are the most likely targets. You know, it's, it's just a, a fact. And I don't know what to say except hold each other in prayer. Yeah. Well, and, and we need to encourage those that we see that are, are fighting the battle, so to speak. You know, we need to support our leaders. Um, words of encouragement are always helpful. I, I know for me, even even getting questions from people in emails, um, I find good, especially when they're challenging questions. I, I find that encouraging. And then often people are very thankful for the answers. So there's a lot of people that I, I minister to through social media and through email and people studying this message. Um, some of them haven't been in the message long. 
and they're, they're spending time to look at this message. It's, it's really quite amazing um, to see the people who are taking to this message. And as they weren't prepared to join these studies, it was important that the light that we have gleaned through Stephen and yourself and Dwight and stuff is presented to them when you have an opportunity to speak to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the things is God has given us in our studies because we, we approached the counsel that Ellen White had given regarding searching for uh, truth, going back over, over the, over the ground, gleaning from the field, especially after July 18th. So, so we've learned a lot of things. I'm fairly sad about the fact that there are some people who aren't interested in anything that we found. Because it was precious and it, and it still is. There's much that we have to examine. Any other thoughts? Okay, another another question. I mean, we've sort of answered it, but um, now that we've come to December twenty fifth, and the seven hundred and seventy seven days have passed, where do we go from here? What has God been showing us? Dwight, what has God been showing us? Dwight's there. Maybe he's I'm there. here. Well, we we have to take this message to well to the to Levites, right? So. Mm-hmm. Well, the the point right now. For the lively stones to become a temple, the lively stones must become united. Okay. Now we become united with Christ. That is, if we're following Christ individually, we don't. We don't need uh, an official organization. We didn't need to vote in president and select some elders and create a bunch of church discipline. No, on, on on that point, we're in full agreement. Yes. Okay. Um, but God does want us in unity. The, the point that I'm trying to make is that the building does not unify itself. Okay. The, build, the, the temple is, at this time, is erected and constructed, would we also say, without hands. Yeah, so God has actually been involved in constructing this temple. Right. And we are the living stones. That's the point. Yeah. And, and understanding that, understanding our interconnectedness and our interdependency. Um, you know, if, if I'm a stone in a building, do I need the other stones in the building to be a part of the building? Yes. If they start removing those stones, the building, the whole structure is going to fall apart. Correct. But we know this is a building that God has constructed and that each stone has been laid carefully. And in spite of how um, common that stone is, how un, how not well formed or whatever we might think about ourselves, we're still part of a bigger structure. And that's where our value lies. It doesn't lie in we're not we're not a precious gem in a stone building that just stands out on its own. We're part of a structure. We need one another. Yeah, we are. We are the temple of God. So. Mm-hmm. And we need to be able to recognize that we can't bring division. We can't say to the hand, why are you not a, 
uh, why are you not a foot like me? You know, and often we expect others to be like us. But we need to recognize the, whether it's a stone of honor or a stone of dishonor, so to speak, that each one's precious. And we should seek everything we can do <clears throat> to communicate this truth to each other. You know, when I look at myself, I'm not a good people person. Um, I'm not, I'm not a good encourager. I don't really spend a lot of time keeping in touch with people. Can't do small talk, but I do what I can. And what I can is study the Bible and share. And, and I'm thankful for that, that at least I have that to do. Even if I can't be everything. Now, Heidi loves people and she interacts with people readily and get my energy from man, well she gets energy from talking to people but um you know for me it's it it, it drains me and i, and I have a, a job where i have to deal with people all the time i'm always happy when nobody's in the store <laughs> sure it's nice somebody comes in and buys something but but i still spend a lot of time with people i'll sometimes spend a couple of hours with a customer um but it does drain me even if I really like the person. So, so God's given us all different gifts and that's why we need one another. Amen. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just kind of withdrawn because when I get under stress, that's what I do is I just, I'm like a dog I drag myself off away from everybody else yeah. and, and wait until I'm well, you know, but I've been kind of waiting until I've been well for a long time. So I think I need to learn some different things. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Sometimes the healing comes by doing the little things that God gives us to do each day. And sometimes because we don't think we can do much, we don't do anything. Yeah, that would be me right now. I've been doing better, but still, yeah. Well, I definitely appreciate and, that you're here. And and also my husband uh, was supposed to bring home, we have a black lab. Yeah. Um, he was supposed to bring home one Rottweiler puppy. Mm -hmm. About four weeks ago, he brought home two Rottweiler puppies. So well, you have an insane life and I just I just cannot see how it's working because two bond and three buddy up two at a, two and one out always. So yeah. so I've been struggling with just life is and every one of us has got this, you know. It, yeah. it's, no, the the pets that you have are supposed to be a blessing not a uh, not a stress. Um, so yeah, we used to have three cats and it's good. We only have two. Mm -hmm. So that being said, anybody who wants an amazing Rottweiler puppy, half trained, let me know. Please help her yeah. to help yourself. Which, which half is trained? <laughs> <laughs> the back half for sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, well, that's good. <laughs> that's a blessing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm pretty worn out, but uh, I'd like to have a little bit of a season of prayer. So, Janice, could you pray? Yes. And uh, James, could mm -hmm. you pray as well? Yes. Yeah. And, and then uh, I'll close with prayer. Thank you, dear Father, that you've given us technology to be able to communicate. Even though today it's been coming and going, and we know that this is a busy day, but throughout it all, you have poured out your blessing. You've, you've inspired the speakers, Lord, to to present your message and to also present their humanity. And Lord, I know that 
I know that there are struggles for each one of us, and and you know each one of us individually, Lord. When we pray for each other, even though we might not know what's going on, Lord, you know. And I ask that you you just look inside our hearts individually, Lord, and and know that in this moment we're asking for your help. We're trusting that you will answer our prayers. And Lord, we're a little group and we're torn apart at times and we need to come together. We need to be strong in your word. We need to be strengthened by your angels, Lord. We need to be protected. And Lord, we need direction on on where we're where we're going. And we trust that you will provide that direction, please, for all of us. Lord, provide a healing for our hearts, provide a healing for our bodies, prepare Mm -hmm. us for the time of trouble coming ahead, and let us be diligent and ever, ever relying on light behind us and not rejecting truth, Lord. We trust that you hear this prayer and we trust that you answer. In Jesus' holy name Mm -hmm. we pray. Amen. Amen. And Lord, we just... uh Thank you, Lord, that you are in in control, even from the very beginning of this movement, Lord. And we can see, uh, or at least most of us, I think, can see that the prophetic lines are are sound. Um, For those who can't see that, Lord, yet, Help them to study, Lord, to show themselves approved unto you, not unto others, Lord, and to make this message their their own by by, by studying, because that's that's the key is to study, not just to be passive in things and accepting things without studying it, Lord. Jesus. And we just thank you, Lord, for that. And we just lift up everyone in the movement, Lord. And we know that we all have each of our struggles, Lord. We just ask you, Lord, to each each and every one of us to put that on at your feet, dear Lord, and uh, may may everyone gain the victory over their iniquities. And we also, Lord, lift up our, our loved ones. Uh, we pray for their well-being. Pray for their salvation, Lord. And, uh, help each and every one of us be a good witness to others around us, uh, especially to our Seventh-day Adventist brethren. And uh, we just uh, thank you for this. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dear Father in heaven, we leave all things in your hands. We leave this movement in your hands, and we give our hearts to you. We ask that you can fulfill your promises in us, that you can heal us, that you can use us as your instruments in bringing light and truth to others. Help us to figure out individually the things that we need to do, Mm. the tasks that you put before us. We ask that we can do them faithfully Mm. and that we can leave the results in your hands. Help us to not look at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. That we can see with spiritual eyes your kingdom being built up. Thank you for each person. May your angels watch over us. And may you continue to bless those in this movement. And we thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, everyone. God bless. Have a good day. Thank you, Theodore. You too. Good night. Yeah. Well, thanks, Rob. God bless. Yes, God bless, okay. everyone. Thank you, Theodore. Thank you so much. You're welcome.